tonight arrested for wire fraud and money laundering. I'm going to fight my battle. I'm going to deliver. I'm going to fight the witch hunt. I'm going to take care of clearing my name, and I look forward to doing that. The new details on embattled Congressman George Santos after he surrendered to authorities following an indictment on 13 counts. Plus... How disruptive was it to lose all the technology that's connected to the network? Uh, pretty, pretty disruptive, just because you need to have information fast, and not having information is probably the most panic-inducing thing. It's like I can't make a decision if I don't have information. The cyber attacks that are getting more frequent and deadlier for patients we take you to the hospitals on the front lines of trying to prepare and respond and I truly just loved creating and you know when you build a little community you want to continue to feed them TikTok and Instagram influencers may be all the rage but it was youtubers who first broke that viral mold we'll sit down with a couple of Asian American and Pacific Islander influencers on how they've used their platform to showcase not just themselves but their cultures Good evening, I'm Phil Lipoff, and tonight for Lindsay Davis, thanks so much for streaming with us. We are following those stories and much more, including the preparations underway at the border as officials send resources ahead of Title 42 expiring, plus the important vote that paves the way for abortion pills to be sold over the counter, and the moment public service workers got this, a surprise encounter while looking into some potholes. Our correspondents are fanned out across the country covering those stories and more for us tonight. But be we begin with Congressman George Santos pleading not guilty to a sweeping indictment accusing him of widespread financial crimes. The 13-count indictment accuses Santos of defrauding donors, defrauding the unemployment benefit system, and defrauding the House of Representatives itself. Tonight, Santos is free on a $500,000 bond as he was swarmed, as you see here, by reporters outside federal court in Central Islip, New York. He called the prosecution a witch hunt and vowed not to resign. More than a dozen of his Republican colleagues, though, have called for him to step down. So what comes next? Senior congressional correspondent Rachel Scott leads us off tonight from that courthouse on Long Island. Let him walk. Let him walk. Everyone relax. He has already admitted to lying to his constituents. And tonight, Congressman George Santos facing criminal charges, swarmed by reporters outside federal court, where he pleaded not guilty to 13 federal counts, including wire fraud, money laundering, and theft of public funds. The hearing, just 10 minutes. The judge reading the charges, asking Santos if he understood his rights. His answer, yes, ma'am. The congressman surrendered his passport and was released on a $500,000 bond. Outside the court, officers fighting to clear the way. You guys are going to trip. You guys are going to trip. As Santos pushed toward the podium and declared his innocence. Now I'm going to have to go and fight to defend myself. The reality is, is it's a witch hunt. Prosecutors charge Santos concocted a scheme to raise $50,000 in donations to help his campaign and spent the money on luxury designer clothing, credit card payments, a car payment, and payments on personal debts. They say he also pocketed some of the cash. Santos was also charged with filing false unemployment claims at the height of the pandemic while he was running for Congress, collecting more than $24,000 in benefits, even though he had a job, a $120,000 a year position at an investment firm. Why would you apply for unemployment benefits when you had a job making $120,000 a year? Rachel, this is part of my defense. This is inaccurate information, and I will get to clear my name on this during the pandemic. It wasn't very clear. I don't understand where the government's getting their information, but I will present but my prosecutors facts. Say so you got over, you excuse me, prosecutors say that you got over $20,000 in unemployment benefits, right. sir. But How is that acceptable? Ma'am, like I said, my employment was changed during the time. I don't understand where the government's coming from. I'll present my defense. And Santos also accused of making false, fictitious, and fraudulent statements to Congress in his required financial disclosure filings, including inflating his salary and assets while failing to disclose other income and concealing the unemployment payments. Santos today declaring his innocence. Are you planning on running for re-election? Yes, I am. But on Capitol Hill, at least a dozen House Republicans say it's time for Santos to resign. It's a distraction, and uh, and it's a punchline for a lot of uh, commentary regarding the Republican Party that we don't need. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy, who is counting on Santos's vote to remain in power, is not calling for him to step down. But tonight, for the first time, McCarthy said the congressman should not run for re-election. Santos has a lot more. Uh, I, think, I think he has other things to focus on his life than running for stuff. 
And Rachel joins me now from New York. Rachel, Congressman Santos is also facing other investigations as well, right? Exactly, Phil. This is just one of many. He's also facing a separate investigation by the House Ethics Committee, as well as separate charges in Brazil over allegations of check fraud, which he also denies. A hearing on that case is scheduled for tomorrow, Phil. All right. Rachel Scott from New York tonight. Rachel, thank you. For more now, let's bring in defense attorney and former assistant Manhattan district attorney, Jeremy Saland. Uh, Jeremy, thanks so much for joining us. Let's just start with your reaction to the substance of this 13 count, 19 page indictment against Santos. And I wanna first focus on the charges of donor fraud. How significant are those charges of using donor funds for personal benefit? From what I understand from reading the indictment is he really, for lack of a better term, duped the public and arguably knowingly so, hence the indictment, intentionally so, to use those monies for himself. It's very egregious. The dollar amount may not be as egregious as we've seen in the past, but it's a constant ongoing scheme that I think really puts him in the most danger. Yeah, and that's no doubt gonna resonate with voters as well. I'm wondering about uh, improperly receiving unemployment benefits as well, because a lot of people in this country uh, so rely on that and what the charges he was actually making money while he was receiving those benefits. Yeah, you know, you're not gonna make any friends and help your defense when you are scheming, to, as alleged, you are scheming to take money when people were at their most vulnerable and most desperate and needed those dollars to pay for their family's mortgage, to pay for food on the table, to keep businesses afloat. And every time, every week that Mr. Santos has allegedly had signed off and said, I'm unemployed, I'm unemployed, I'm unemployed, and then collecting those dollars, even though it's only in the tens of thousands, it's, it's offensive to the average American, and rightfully so. You know, I know from covering cases like this that the public integrity unit will move quickly if they have the evidence. But I'm wondering, were you surprised by the speed of this investigation and the indictment? And what, if anything, do you think that says about the government's case? Well, speed, you know, we don't know when this ultimately started or when it initiated. I think the government started to look into Mr. Santos once his lies were being revealed. And there's been so many lies, not necessarily in the four corners of this indictment, but in terms of his conduct. So it doesn't shock me that we're at this point. Some might argue what took so long, but the government seems to have a very strong case, at least for some of the charges, if not most of them. Again, there's records and records don't lie. Records tell the truth. And if he was collecting, for example, as we just discussed before, unemployment benefits, but at the same time depositing checks into his bank account for work, there's really no defense to that. It speaks for itself. So we heard Santos after leaving the courthouse today. I'm sure you saw some of that. And if you didn't, he basically stood there in front of a gaggle of reporters and said this was the beginning of his ability to address the charges and defend himself while calling this a familiar term, a witch hunt. Uh, what did you make of his remarks, his demeanor at the time of his remarks, and how he's handling this publicly? You know, this was sort of the Donald Trump peacock feather defense. And look at me, and I'm the victim here. And it, it shocks me that an attorney would allow his client or her client to be so open and start saying things and without having control on a leash because he came across as cavalier, arrogant. I think he said something about, this will be my book. I'm going to stay in Congress. Uh, it's a witch hunt. Again, talking points of Donald Trump. He did himself no favors. He, he seemed to relish the moment, arguably, which does not really do anything for him before a judge who has the discretion, if there's a conviction, to sentence him well beyond the guidelines or less than the guidelines. So he really was foolish. If you were his defense attorney, what kind of credible defense uh, could Santos mount based on the charges against him and based on the, you know, the, the lies we know to be true so far? They are starting, you know, a three-legged race with which is difficult enough with no legs, well behind everybody. It's extremely difficult because the papers don't lie. The potential witnesses who when we talk about these people in the indictment, there's a lot that he has to deal with. But the government, when they go after a legislator, they are very serious about it and they do their homework. Defense Attorney Jeremy Salan, thank you so much for the conversation. We appreciate the insight. Thank you. And now to the U.S.-Mexico border, where in just a day, Title 42, that pandemic era, 
pandemic era rule that allowed the U.S. to turn asylum seekers away is set to expire. Crowds have already begun, as you see, to gather at the border as U.S. officials brace for a new surge of migrants. Hundreds of National Guards members deployed, some actually in riot gear. Matt Rivers on the Mexico side of the border, Maria Villarreal on the U.S. side, reporting on what's going on in this particular moment in time. Tonight, with just over 24 hours to go before Title 42 expires, migrants crowding at the southern border. From California to Arizona to Texas, where the National Guard is already in place, wearing riot gear in Brownsville. Federal agents sweeping through the streets of El Paso, waking migrants before dawn with flyers, warning those who had entered illegally and had not filed the proper paperwork to turn themselves in or risk being deported. Lines of migrants surrendering to Border Patrol in El Paso this week. Title 42, the pandemic era policy that quickly expelled migrants based on COVID concerns, will end late Thursday night. And tonight, DHS Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas with a direct message. We are making it very clear that our border is not open, that crossing irregularly is against the law, and that those who are not eligible for relief will be quickly returned. DHS saying 1.4 million people have already been sent back in the last year, but Mayorkas reiterating there is a path for migrants to come in legally. Individuals who qualify for relief under our laws have a basis to remain in the United States. The contributions of immigrants to this country is quite clear. Still, starting Friday, it will be harder to claim asylum, requiring migrants to have applied for and been denied asylum in another country before being allowed to apply here in the U.S. Anyone deported is subject to at least a five-year ban from the U.S. Here at the border, migrants rushing to be processed by Border Patrol before that takes effect. We've been here for days now watching as hundreds if not thousands of migrants have crossed from Mexico going under this concertina wire and are now trapped in the shadow of the U.S. border wall in the harsh desert conditions. Here on the U.S. side near the wall, the problem has become transportation and processing. They can't get buses here fast enough to pick up all of these migrants that are coming through the wall. So groups are being metered by Border Patrol. Migrants searched as they make it through that fence and onto buses to be processed. Tonight, across the country, leaders stressing they're already overwhelmed. From Chicago. Chicago simply does not have the infrastructure or resources to continue and mainly providing for migrants. To New York State, where Rockland County is now seeking a temporary restraining order against the city of New York after the mayor there announced he would send migrants to that county. They just say basically, Rockland, be damned. We're going to do what we want to do. President Biden overnight warning this could take some time. We're doing all we can. It's going to be chaotic for a while. And Matt Rivers joins me now. Matt, how is the Border Patrol preparing for this tonight? Well, Phil, uh, the Border Patrol saying that facilities in five of its nine regions along the U.S. southwest border are over capacity. But it does appear uh, that this current migrant surge, the peak of it, may well be over. The Border Patrol chief now saying that he is not expecting the massive spike in migrant crossings post Title 42 that so many have been predicting. Phil. All right. Matt Rivers tonight. Thank you. Now to former President Trump, who has been ordered to pay columnist E. Jean Carroll $5 million after a jury found him liable for sexual battery and defamation. But will the verdict cost him politically? ABC senior investigative reporter Aaron Katursky has reaction from Trump's fellow Republicans. Tonight, vindication for E. Jean Carroll. I feel fantastic. <laughs> I have. It is, yesterday was probably the happiest day of my life. Carol winning her defamation and battery lawsuit, the jury awarding her $5 million in damages after finding former President Trump sexually abused her. She described the moment Trump's attorney came up to her to shake her hand in the courtroom. He came over to congratulate me. He put out his hand and I said, he did it and you know it. And then we shook hands and I passed by. So I got my chance to say it. Overnight, Trump's anger on full display. He posted multiple messages and videos on social media. I have absolutely no idea who this woman is. The verdict is a disgrace, a continuation of the greatest witch hunt of all time. 
absolutely a shame. Trump's Republican support has been mostly unshakable. I think it's just, a, frankly, another example of the way in which we're, our system is trying to use lawfare to attack Donald Trump. But for Republicans who have already moved on from Trump, the verdict reaffirmed their doubts. Well, the jury of President Trump's uh, peers uh, found him responsible for sexual assault. I hope the jury of the American people reached the same conclusion, uh, which is he is not fit to become president of the United States. And Aaron Katursky joins me now. Aaron, I guess time will tell if this case impacts Trump politically, but as we know, there are more cases looming right now. Give us a breakdown of what else the former president is going to face. Many more, Phil, in addition to the outcome of this civil case. Voters could consider Trump's criminal charges here in New York or the possibility that he could be indicted in Georgia. And at the federal level, a special counsel is investigating two things, Trump's role on January 6th and how he handled classified material. Phil. Much more to come. Aaron Katursky, thank you. We are monitoring also tonight the situation in the Middle East, where at least 19 Palestinians have been killed by airstrikes in Gaza. Since Monday, dozens have been injured. This unrest comes after Israeli defense forces targeted what they say are Islamic jihadists across the Gaza Strip following rockets that Israeli media reports were fired from Gaza. At least 400 rockets, they say. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu today told Israel they are, quote, ready for a possibility of an expanded campaign, adding that anyone who harms the nation will have, quote, blood on his head. The U.S. Army sergeant uh, has been sentenced to 25 years in prison for shooting and killing an armed man during a Black Lives Matter protest in Austin, Texas in 2020 after a jury convicted Daniel Perry of murder last month. Governor Greg Abbott vowed to pardon him. Now the Texas Pardon and Parole Board is already reviewing that case. Here's Steve Osinsami. This is the prison sentence tonight for the shooting death of a street protester that the Texas governor is already promising to pardon. This court sentences you to a term of 25 years. A Texas judge sent 36-year-old Daniel Perry to prison for murdering this man, 28-year-old Garrett Foster. Both the victim and the murderer are white, and both men served in the military. But long before today's sentencing, Texas Governor Greg Abbott had outraged the victim's family and supporters when he announced that he would approve a recommendation to pardon the convicted murderer, quote, as soon as it hits my desk. The shooting took place during the summer protests of 2020. Foster and his fiance, who is African-American, were in downtown Austin with marchers from Black Lives Matter. Daniel Perry was in a car driving for a rideshare company when he pulled into a crowd of protesters. And Foster, who was with the crowd, was legally carrying an assault rifle as he approached the car. That's when Perry, who was inside, started shooting with his handgun, sending everyone running. I remember hearing gunshots and then just him falling over in front of me. I've been trying to figure out how to cope and live without him because he was everything to me. The victim's mother says the governor needs to let this court's decision stand. Do you have any idea how hard it is to sit here facing the evil that killed my son. Finally, after three long years, we're finally getting justice for Garrett. And Steve joins me now. Steve, what's the governor saying about Perry's case? Well, Phil, the Texas governor is saying that this should have been a stand your ground case, arguing, in his opinion, that this convicted murderer was just defending himself. But shortly before the shooting, Texas police say that Perry was all over social media talking about shooting protesters. His lawyers tonight, Phil, are saying that they're going to cooperate fully with the pardon process. Phil. Steve Osinsami from Atlanta tonight. Steve, thank you. Big news out of the FDA today after the panel of advisors unanimously voted in favor of allowing a specific birth control pill to be sold without a prescription. The decision comes after medical and scientific experts advised the FDA on the re recommendation of O-Pill, a progestin-only pill made by French drug maker HRA Pharma. One doctor and advisor called the safety and effectiveness of the pill very reassuring. The company says if the FDA takes this non-binding recommendation and greenlights the application, the abortion pill can be available as early as this summer. This would make it the first ever over-the-counter hormonal birth control pill. 
To the economy now, the rate of inflation has slowed for the 10th straight month. Consumer prices in April were 4.9% higher than a year ago, now under 5%, the first time in nearly two years. This is better than economists expected. And for the second month in a row, the cost of groceries fell. Prices for fruit, vegetables, meat, eggs, all down from a month ago. Now to an ABC News exclusive with the mother of the Virginia six-year-old who shot his teacher. She is speaking out about it for the first time after a Virginia grand jury indicted and charged her with child neglect and failing to secure her son. Our Lindsay Davis spoke with that mom and her grandfather, who now has custody of the six-year-old. She says she wants people to know she's a good mom. While school shootings in the U.S. are no longer a rarity, what happened at this Virginia elementary school in January was shocking. The shooter was only six years old. The victim, his 25-year-old teacher, Abigail Zwerner. Despite being shot, she managed to get all of her students to safety. Female victim, she's been shot in the abdomen as well as a through and through into the hand. Amid the ongoing criminal and civil cases, the family of the first grader who shot his teacher has remained quiet until now. Does he talk about the incident? No. We talk, we play, we, you know, do Uno, draw pictures, but nothing of the incident. Deja Taylor says she was stunned on January 6th when she got a phone call that there had been a shooting at her child's school. I wasn't even able to get dressed. I ran out in PJs to the school. Has he processed the magnitude of, of what happened? Well, in my opinion, um, he processes the events leading up to it. Um, he talks a lot more about the day before or the two days before um, than he does about January 6th. You released a statement shortly after the incident, and I just want to quote it. You said, our son suffers from an acute disability and was under a care plan at the school that included his mother or father attending school with him and accompanying him to class every day. The week of the shooting was the first week when we were not in class with him. What can you tell us specifically about your son's disability? He has ADHD. Some are able to have it at a very mild rate, but he's off the wall, doesn't sit still ever. And why did the school decide that it was no not longer necessary for the family to be in, in class? Because we ended up working with another doctor. He had started medication, and he was meeting his goals um, academically. Had your son ever spoken like about hurting the teacher, or was there anything, like any angst that he had against her? No, he actually really liked her. I will say that week he did come home and he was talking, you know, a lot about how he felt like he was being ignored. So he would come home and, Mom, I don't think that she was listening to me. I didn't like that. And then actually he ended up getting suspended the next day because he was in class. He was trying to tell her something. Um, and she asked him to go sit back down. He threw his arms up, he said, fine. And when he threw his arms up, he knocked her phone out of her hand on accident. And he got suspended for that. Zwerner did not respond to ABC News's request for comment, but in a lawsuit, she says the student slammed the cell phone on the ground so hard that it cracked and shattered. She's now filed a $40 million lawsuit against the Newport News School District and Rich Neck Elementary officials, claiming they ignored multiple warnings about the student's behavior and concerns that he had a gun. According to the suit, the child had a history of random violence and that he attacked students and teachers alike both in and out of school. Is that description accurate? Whether it is or it isn't, the school enrolled him in September knowing all of the past behaviors, and they also knew that he had not attended only about two months of kindergarten and about two months of pre-K. And you say that to say that they then own the responsibility? Absolutely. If they believed all these behaviors to be true, and they should not have allowed him to be into first grade. The school district released a statement to ABC News saying it cannot release information about a student's educational record. And last month, the district filed to dismiss Werner's suit, arguing her injuries fall under workers' compensation. The gun used in the shooting was legally purchased by Taylor. She says it was kept locked away. How did your son access the gun? Nobody knows. No one knows? You'd have to ask him. Have you asked him? No, not yet. That's certainly something that will be probably brought out during litigation. 
Let me just ask this, and I'll direct it to you, Jimmy. Is it that no one has asked him how he got it, or you're just not ready to reveal how he got it? I'm not, we're not ready to discuss that at oh, this okay. point. Understood. Um, I've, I'm, I am, yes, people have talked to him about that. I don't know that an, any adult knows exactly how he got the gun. Was the gun locked somewhere? It was locked somewhere. Mm -hmm. In April, Taylor was charged with a felony count of child neglect and a misdemeanor count of recklessly leaving a firearm as to endanger a child. Her trial is set for August. What was your reaction to those charges? I am not sure. It was, it was shocking. It still is a little shocking. Do you feel in any way responsible for the shooting? Yes, of course. Um, that is my son. So I am, as a parent, obviously willing to take responsibility for him because he can't take responsibility for himself. The idea that, that you could face up to six years in, in prison, do you feel that that would be a fair penalty? I mean, of course, I don't believe that that is fair. Um, but anything for my baby. Do you feel that there is some racial component to it? Absolutely. I think that... Um, if the dynamics were different, if the teacher was maybe looking like me and the student was Caucasian or another nationality, it wouldn't be as pumped up as much. Anything that, that either of you would like to say to Abigail Werner? First of all, I'd like to say that I'm glad you're doing better. I'm sorry that you got hurt. Just like I'm sorry that the kids in that classroom had to witness such a terrible uh, incident. But on the same token, I'm really sorry my great-grandson had to go through this ordeal. I just truly would like to apologize that, you know, out of the incident, she did get hurt. We were actually kind of forming, like, a relationship with me having to be in the classroom. Um, and she was a really bright person. Our thanks to Lindsay Davis for that exclusive interview. Still much more to get to here on Prime. Coming up, why your next flight booking could come from Uber. But next, cyber attacks are hitting U.S. companies coast to coast. It's hospitals, though, that may have the most vulnerability. In tonight's Prime Focus, how they're preparing in an effort to make sure the consequences of these attacks are not deadly. We actually sent some staff to Best Buy to buy walkie-talkies. And we started switching over to our paper systems. I got a call from our IT leader. He said, every server that we have has been infected. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. NBC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. So much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. Been a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? Thank you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show.
Welcome back. Cyber attacks have caused costly breaches of personal data and disruption of critical systems like oil pipelines and mass transit, but they are also increasingly a matter of life and death. So in tonight's prime focus, we examine why America's hospitals are becoming a top target for hackers and how they're already having a dramatic impact on our health care. Tonight, our Devin Dwyer has some new research and what can be done about these attacks. Squeeze my hand, sir, best you can. Let's get him on the vent. Let's call ICU. I'm okay. just trying to think. Do we In the emergency room, right minutes now, and seconds can decide life or death. Sorry, chest compressions. Thank you. Simulations like this one train doctors to respond quickly to the unexpected. Charging. Check. Shocking. We were invited to watch Dr. Arman Hussein, a second year resident, practice his skills when suddenly. There is something happening with our IT systems right now. A mock cyber attack locks down his computer as he's treating patients in crisis. Our, our monitor is down. Dr. Hussein is calm under pressure, but instantly without critical tools. I don't even know where the paper charts are. Like electronic patient records, test results, in contact with other departments and hospitals. How disruptive was it to lose? all the technology that's connected to the network? Uh, pretty, pretty disruptive just because you need to have information fast and not having information is probably the most panic inducing thing. It's like I can't make a decision if I don't have information. It happened in real life three years ago just as the pandemic was taking hold. Cyber criminals targeted the University of Vermont hospital network. It was terrible. Dr. I mean, Stephen was, Leffler, the hospital's president, was seeing patients in Burlington that day. My email stopped working, which is odd, but not, it does happen once in a while. Was a cyber attack even in your consciousness? No, I didn't even think that was a possibility. It was challenging because um, our phones weren't working. We actually sent some staff to Best Buy to buy walkie talkies. And we started switching over to our paper systems. I got a call from our IT leader. He said, every server that we have has been infected. Those servers were immediately taken offline. Leffler says no patient information was leaked, but that the impact on patient care was substantial. There were people that were scheduled for staging cancer operations, and we had to make a decision, should we do it? And we did them when it was appropriate, some were able to delay. The crisis stretched for 28 days. 1,300 hospital servers and 5,000 computers had to be wiped, a job so big the governor called in the National Guard. All told, it cost the hospital more than $50 million, an expense some experts say inevitably drives up the cost of care. We've had three years of COVID. This was much harder by a factor of 10. Harder than COVID. Much harder for us. Very, very lucky. Jess Krauss and his wife, Kara, were UVM patients at the time and lived through it. I had been diagnosed in early September with stage three uh, colorectal cancer. But you really don't know if you're going to live or die at that point. Just as his doctors began an aggressive radiation and chemo plan, Krauss was told it all had to be put on hold indefinitely. I got a call that day saying, yeah, yeah. <laughs> don't, come. We, we, we don't come, you know, we're, we're figuring it out. We were like, what? Like, this is really critical life or death treatment, radiation, and it was very timely because Jess's tumor was quite large. How many appointments did you have to miss? Do you remember? Probably about a week. We were afraid. We yeah. weren't sure if that would affect the outcome. Again, the tumor, would it start growing back within that week? We ready? Come on, bud. Today, Krauss's cancer is in remission, and he's sounding the alarm about the impact of cyber attacks on patients. In the grand scheme of things, you know, it's easy to look at it now and say, okay, yeah, you know, it was a week delay and it didn't really impact it. I hope that it's been a lesson learned to hospitals. You need to have systems in place to be able to to be able to immediately pivot if you need to. Research shows cyber attacks on hospitals, once thought to be most damaging to patient privacy, are potentially endangering American lives. A cyber attack on a hospital is not an economic crime. It is not a victimless crime. These are direct threats to patient safety and threats to life crimes. The number of cyber attacks on U.S. hospitals each year has doubled since 2016, from 43 incidents to 91 in 2021. Experts say healthcare networks are ripe targets because they're most vulnerable and because hospitals are most likely to pay a ransom. And our IT experts knew 
as soon as they looked at what happened, that a ransom would not have restored our system. And so we did not pay the ransom. We did not contact the people who did it. A new government analysis finds nearly all hospitals are operating with critical systems or software with known vulnerabilities. But only half, according to the report, have a plan to address them. What's the biggest lesson you think other hospitals in America need to take from what happened at UVM? It can happen to you. Even when you think it's impossible, it can happen. And um, it affects everything you do um, in the ways you provide care for your patients. U.S. public health officials say cyber attacks are the single largest threat to America's hospitals, deserving immediate attention. The average incident disrupting patient care for 19 days and stretching far beyond an individual hospital. Our studies showed the secondary effects, these blast radius ecosystem effects, uh, and saw increased emergency department patients. They saw way more patients than they normally do. If you're in the waiting room, you waited longer at hospitals next to ransomware attacks because there were so many more patients. So way more ambulances, one's a trauma center, one's a stroke center. When those types of specialty centers go down, those patients go to the periphery. So a cyber attack on one hospital has a much broader effect huge effect in the entire region. I was just like, all right, I'm not gonna use that. We'll just go to manual everything. Dr. Hussein says more practice without computers is urgently okay. needed. Strong work, guys. Done. Way go team. But experts say hospital administrators also need to beef up their defenses. Josh Corman, a top U.S. cybersecurity expert who helped design the simulation we saw, says a mindset shift is needed and fast. We're just not trained for this. We're not prepared for this. We implicitly trust and depend on these uh, technologies. And when they don't, they're not available, bad things can happen. If you can greatly reduce or eliminate the impact by having multiple systems in place, then that seems like it would be, it would be an important step forward. I feel like we're some of the lucky ones, you know, that we had an amazing doctor who went above and beyond. But I think system improvements to communication need to happen, um, but especially now. Right, and that's why it's a true matter of life and death. Our thanks to Devin for that. Still much more to get to coming up, how Vice President Kamala Harris is breaking a barrier at one of the country's most prestigious military academies. But next, private jet travel is expected to reach its highest level yet this year, and it's costing the public and the environment. So we'll take a look by the numbers. at stake. So much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Brooke Shields, the most photographed woman in the world. A sexualized child model. Exploitation. What happened to her isn't really about hers. It's just about women. I let myself be vulnerable. And this is the first time I've ever spoken about what happened. I thought my one no should have been enough. You know. When someone like Brooke Shields talks about it, it makes a difference. I'm amazed that I survived any of it. With so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. Been a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the 
see it, there's always a better show. Absolutely. Always. Absolutely. That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasure that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby. It was crazy. Behind the Table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. I feel like the weight of the world is on my shoulders. I've seen a lot. I've been through a lot without ever having a chance to share my side of the story. Aaron Carter's life story in one sentence. The drugs, the drinking, everything goes back to tragedy. I just know I've turned it around and I've got a lot to say. There's always two sides to every I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. Private jet travel is expected to reach its highest level ever in 2023. And while the exclusive trips may only be for the ultra-rich, it's not without cost to the public and the environment. According to a recent report by the Institute for Policy Studies and the organization Patriotic Millionaires, here are some of the details by the numbers. Just 0.0008% of the global population can afford to own a private jet. Yet private jets generate 10 times more carbon emissions than commercial airlines on a per passenger basis. Since the start of the pandemic, private jet use has increased by 20%, creating a 23% increase in private jet emissions. One example, Elon Musk produced 2,112 tons of carbon dioxide emissions last year alone, taking about one private flight every other day. That's 132 times more than the entire carbon footprint of a typical American. So the bottom line, about 1% of people are believed to be responsible for about half of all aviation carbon emissions. Beyond the environmental impact, the report finds private jet use use more than their share of public infrastructure. They make up nearly 17% of the flights handled by the FAA, but contribute just 2% of the taxes that fund that agency. The report's authors argue for taxes of 10% for used, 5% for new private planes, fees that would have raised $2.6 billion in 2022 alone. They also suggest increasing the fuel tax for private planes. Canada, by the way, implemented a 10% tax on new private jets last year. Europe's fourth largest airport, Amsterdam, recently sent shockwaves through the industry when it announced it wants to bar private jets entirely. There's much more ahead here on Prime, including the moment public service workers got a surprise encounter while looking into some potholes. Plus, what happens when you bring some top Asian American TikTok and Instagram influencers and OG YouTubers, yes, they're OG now, together? Their differences, their similarities, and how they're paving the way for their own cultures. It's crazy to see that there's a next generation or there's young people that grew up saying, oh, I don't want to be a TV star, I want to be a content creator. I want to like, I, or I'm in the industry of, of film, Hollywood, whatever, because of you. What does it take to be America's number one news? It takes asking the straightforward, tough questions. Do you believe that Donald Trump should ever be president again? How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? The news-making interviews. You said that there were six friends. One of them was sick. Yeah. Do you have future political aspirations? Going to the front line. The search for survivors. How does this war end? And getting to the heart of the story. Thank you for being here. We'll be here for the long run. ABC News, number one in the morning. The number one newscast. Number one in daytime talk. Friday nights, Sunday mornings versus the competition. And the number one streaming news. Thank you for making ABC News America's trusted, straightforward first choice. With so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. At a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live.
the crushing of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. I feel like the weight of the world is on my shoulders. I've seen a lot. I've been through a lot without ever having a chance to share my side of the story. Aaron Carter's life story in one sentence. The drugs, the drinking, everything goes back to tragedy. I just know I've turned it around and I've got a lot to say. There's always two sides to every story. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. 13 women opened their doors to the man who would end their lives. Truth and Lies, The Boston Strangler, the new true crime podcast series. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts and watch Boston Strangler starring Kira Knightley, streaming on Hulu. Welcome back. Booking your next flight via Uber, the big surprise in store for some Florida public service workers, and the top dog and runner-ups at this year's Westminster Best in Show. These stories and more in tonight's rundown. Norfolk Southern has outlined a plan to pay residents of East Palestine, Ohio, impacted by February's train derailment. Norfolk Southern CEO Alan Shaw wrote to state lawmakers Tuesday night about the plan, which commits to establishing a fund to compensate homeowners whose properties lost value because of the derailment. Homeowners within a five-mile radius of the derailment site would be eligible if they sell their homes for less than what their property's appraised value was before February 3rd. Norfolk Southern last month reported that the derailment had cost the company an initial $387 million. Vice President Kamala Harris will be making history at West Point later this month. A White House official tells ABC News the VP will be delivering the commencement speech at the U.S. Military Academy on May 27th, becoming the first woman to do so. Harris has delivered commencement speeches at the U.S. Coast Guard and Naval Academies in her time as Vice President. Meanwhile, President Biden is scheduled to speak at commencement ceremonies at the U.S. Air Force Academy and Howard University. Uber will soon allow some riders to book their air travel via the app. The company is planning to roll out a new feature for users in the UK to book plane tickets. The tool will be powered by online travel agent Hopper and allow customers to book both domestic and international flights. Uber users in the UK can already book cars, buses, trains and boat transportation on the app. The flight booking feature will roll out this summer. Cleveland officials are still searching for EMS worker Lachelle Jordan. She was last seen on May 6th, just two days before she was supposed to attend a hearing in a rape trial against Michael Stennett. WEWS reports that Jordan had claimed Stennett was stalking her in the days and months before she disappeared, and that an arrest warrant for Stennett on stalking charges said he was spotted outside her home as recently as two days before her disappearance. There's a $5,000 reward for information on Jordan's location. A stormwater crew in Florida recently had a cold-blooded surprise on the job. Crews in Oviedo were conducting a stormwater pipe inspection to investigate a series of potholes and dispatched a four-wheel robotic camera inside a pipe underground. The robot eventually ran into what crews thought was a toad, but actually was a five-foot-long alligator. The robot eventually got stuck in the pipe and the gator wandered off. Oviedo officials said they were grateful the crews had a robot. And Buddy Holly is top dog. At least at the Westminster Dog Show, the Petit Basse Griffon Vendéon took home the coveted Best in Show prize at the 147th edition of the event. Buddy is the first PBGV to win the big show. The six-year-old from Palm Springs beat out 2,500 competitors of over 200 different breeds to become the ultimate top dog. 
We are celebrating Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander Heritage Month for May. And tonight, we continue our Culture Conversation series, speaking with three social media creators using their platforms to amplify AAPI voices and culture. ABC's Ashan Singh sat down with some of the OG creators on YouTube who have paved the way for a new generation of content creators on TikTok and what their success means for representation online. I don't like when you walk around the house with just your underpants on. Growing up in the 2000s, it was YouTube that first gave a space to create and share content. Five and... The earliest users making silly videos at home. Nope, I'm definitely not a straight-A student. Lip syncing to songs, creating how-to demos, and recording makeup tutorials. And could you believe in those early days that this could be more than a hobby? Yeah, no, was I didn't. Yeah. I didn't. I think it was purely, I truly just loved creating. And, you know, when you build a little community, yeah. you want to continue to feed them, right? You want to continue to inspire them. I feel like in those early days, a lot of the creators were more accidental creators that kind of either chose to step up to the plate or let, chose to let it like fizzle out. The people that kind of leaned into it, they turned themselves into businesses. The platform opening an avenue for many Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders to be seen. Right Cheers, guys. Cheers. Bye -bye. Starting with OG YouTubers like Philip Wang. Josh, this is Alex. Alex, Josh. Hi. Oh! And Chriselle Lim, who held the door open for a new generation of TikTok creators like Drew Afualo. <laughs> I never planned on ever mm. <laughs> becoming a content creator, ever. Uh, and when it started, I did it just for fun. Mm -hmm. Like, I did it because it made me laugh, and I like to make other people laugh. So when you guys first were introduced to YouTube, did you realize how it was going to flip the script for, for media moving forward? Or? I, I didn't. I, I definitely didn't. I don't same, know about you. Same. I, I think, for me, I just saw it as a, another internet tool that could be helpful in just making more stuff. So we had no idea that it could shift culture as much as it has, right? And create those opportunities yeah. for Asian I parents. also think that's one of the main reasons why you see a lot of amazing Asian creators because we were not represented and still not as much. So we use these digital platforms as our main platforms, right? And I think through that, you know, our audiences were like, oh, she looks like me. He yeah. looks like me. I can do that too, right? This is where we were. It allowed us to do it ourselves. Yeah. It opened the world and opened all of us to a lot more opportunities and to show that there is this talent that would not have had any opportunity to showcase themselves if it had to go through the traditional system that mm -hmm. Gate keeps and has that red yeah, tape there. Drew, take me back to the jump for you. When YouTube was introduced, Yeah. <laughs> where were you? Probably were like seventh, seventh yeah. eighth grade. It's probably, I've watched both your videos. <laughs> what? I actually oh, wow. showed, you used to make videos about breakups, <gasps> uh, like how to get over breakups. Uh -huh, yeah. They're like short films. Yeah. I showed my, my girlfriends in oh. college. I was, she was going through a breakup. I said, girl, you need to watch this. Oh, wow. And it, Gosh, don't even ask me about my day. I won't. And I used to watch your fashion videos. <laughs> yeah. This is a full circle yeah. moment, guys. Yeah. Do you look how to tie a scarf? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you taught me how to tie a scarf. Oh, amazing. Um, what did y'all's parents think? My parents have always been very supportive of everything I want to do. I had like a time frame when it really started kicking off. Okay. They were like, all right, like till the end of the year. Let's it's see always a time goes. frame. Yeah, right? I think this is a parent I, parenting I, strategy or no, something. Really. <laughs> and it made me work harder. You are one of the only Samoan co yeah. content creators that yeah. are out there. Really, do you feel like you're on an island when it comes to the, <laughs> to, to the, to the community and, and yeah. what you stand to represent and, and the community that you got to put on your back? I feel a lot of pressure, but I also feel proud to be like one of the first like to really walk through the door and just hold it open for other people i feel like the same way you guys have like paved this new path for your community that's kind of how i feel about mine and that makes me feel good yeah so. i got i got chills like, right. like it, it really is like really encouraging to see like another like the next generation when you said leaving the door open like that's totally how i feel too about yeah. like it can't stop with mm. us i feel like you guys didn't realize what the heck y'all were doing when, when you started doing it. Like it was like, you didn't realize the path you were trailblazing, whereas Drew's probably pretty cognizant of it at the time. Yeah. I remember when we first moved to LA after graduating and we attended some like film festivals or we were get, getting invited to speak at schools, definitely felt this 
agenda that was being put on us mm -hmm. of like, hey, you guys are representing Asian Americans. Wait, 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 I, this is, I don't even understand what I'm getting into. I don't yeah. understand the, the I didn't ask for this. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right. yeah. And we're both parents. To yeah, them. That too, no. And so I, I think we have a sense of responsibility for the next generation coming up. Leave the door open, as you yeah. said. Everyone has you know, um, a seat at the table. I like building such a strong community because it's so hard to get in the door otherwise. Yeah. You almost have to make your own door yeah, and yeah. go in through it. A lot of times if you cut off a white audience, a, like, you may not make it in mainstream if they don't like you. So, like, having other POC representation has been able to open the door for me as well. So what do you guys think we can do with a big piece of fabric with two large holes in it? From YouTube videos to fashion blogging, Lim has transitioned over to TikTok, gaining 2.8 million followers, and now owns two successful companies. Coming into the world of YouTube and Instagram, that was very intentional for me because I always knew that I never had those role models. I always looked yeah. up to the blonde hair, blue dyed girl and I wanted mm -hmm. to look like her. I put on extra makeup to like have bigger eyes and lighter hair, dyed my hair. So I knew that if I had this platform which was growing fast early on that I had to represent me and my culture. Obviously, I wanted a, a diversified following, but naturally, my following really started off with Asian girls that looked exactly like me. I think it's about that time. For Wang, Wang Fu Productions started off as a class video project, but now reaches over 3.2 million subscribers on YouTube and is a leading independent Asian American digital company. Everybody needs to stay completely you guys feel like you're in the mainstream now? And Has it ever hit you just how big you guys actually are? It's crazy to see that there's a next generation or there's young people that grew up saying, oh, I don't want to be a TV star, I want to be a content creator. I want to like, mm -hmm. I, or I'm in the industry of, of film, Hollywood, whatever, because of you. Like there's, yeah. you know, actors and directors out there that said they watched Wang Fu and like that's what made them think that they could do it. For me, I'm just really, really proud of the work that we've done in the beginning. The fact that others can have really awesome careers through watching our videos. I mean, for me, that's like the proudest thing. Afwalo has gained 8 million followers on TikTok in just the past two years, catapulting her to a spot hosting on the Oscars red carpet. <laughs> and you started speaking Simone. I didn't even know you were speaking Simone. She now has her own podcast. Sorry, I got another one. Let's see, another one, last one, sorry. When I find myself in spaces I never thought I would be, yeah. the Oscars is a great example. Like, they reached out to me to host for them, which is like crazy. For my Spotify exclusive show, when I got the billboard on the reef, um, I took my whole family to go see yeah. it. And like, we were looking at it and my whole family was so emotional because last names are really important to us. My dad's last name's on the billboard, that's wow. crazy. I feel very grateful that I get to platform my own culture in a way that's never really been seen before in the world of social media. That's cool that I get to see someone that doesn't look like every other white person you see in media. I get to see them create something. I get to see them express themselves through art and, and be seen for something that has nothing to do with what they look like, right? It's just purely just for the love and passion of creating art. Our thanks to Ashan for that. And you can see more of our Culture Conversation series in the coming weeks in a full special airing May 24th. That's our show for this hour. I'm Phil Lipoff. Stay with ABC News Live for more content and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks for streaming with us. And coming up in the next hour, the state of emergency now underway in one of the biggest cities in the world and how they're coping with unprecedented floods. Plus, an increasing number of people are identifying as spiritual but not affiliated with any specific religion. I speak with one of those people using his pulpit to inspire. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. Right now in America, with so much at stake, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now?
I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 store. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. 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 That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby. It was crazy. Behind the table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? How cute. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. I feel like the weight of the world is on my shoulders. I've seen a lot. I've been through a lot without ever having a chance to share my side of the story. Aaron Carter's life story in one sentence. The drugs, the drinking, everything goes back to tragedy. I just know I've turned it around and I've got a lot to say. There's always two sides to every story. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Good evening. I'm Phil Lipoff in tonight for Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We've got a lot of news to get to tonight, including the 13 charge indictment brought against embattled Congressman George Santos, what he told reporters shortly after leaving court, and what is next for the New York lawmaker. Plus, Lindsay's exclusive sit-down with the mother of the six-year-old student who shot his teacher. What she's revealing about her son and the message she's hoping to deliver. And under a state of emergency, the biggest city in the Southern Hemisphere getting hit with a deluge. How residents are now trying to cope with an unprecedented torrent of rain and flooding. But we begin with that federal indictment against Congressman George Santos, the embattled congressman pleading not guilty. The 13-count indictment accuses Santos of defrauding donors, defrauding the unemployment benefit system, and defrauding the House of Representatives itself. Tonight, Santos is free on $500,000 bond. Today, he called the prosecution a witch hunt and vowed not to resign. More than a dozen of his Republican colleagues, however, have called for him to step down. So... What comes next? Senior congressional correspondent Rachel Scott leads us off tonight. Let him walk. Let him walk. Everyone relax. He has already admitted to lying to his constituents. And tonight, Congressman George Santos facing criminal charges, swarmed by reporters outside federal court, where he pleaded not guilty to 13 federal counts, including wire fraud, money laundering, and theft of public funds. The hearing, just 10 minutes. The judge reading the charges, asking Santos if he understood his rights. His answer, yes, ma'am. The congressman surrendered his passport and was released on a $500,000 bond. Outside the court, officers fighting to clear the way. You guys are going to trip. You guys are going to trip. As Santos pushed toward the podium and declared his innocence. Now I'm going to have to go and fight to defend myself. The reality is, is it's a witch hunt. Prosecutors charged Santos concocted a scheme to raise $50,000 in donations to help his campaign and spent the money on luxury designer clothing, credit card payments, a car payment, and payments on personal debts. They say he also pocketed some of the cash. Santos was also charged with filing false unemployment claims at the height of the pandemic while he was running for Congress, collecting more than $24,000 in benefits, even though he had a job, 
a $120,000 a year position at an investment firm. Why would you apply for unemployment benefits when you had a job making $120,000 a year? Rachel, this is part of my defense. This is inaccurate information, and I will get to clear my name on this during the pandemic. It wasn't very clear. I don't understand where the government's getting their information, but I will present but my prosecutors facts. Say so that you got over, excuse me, prosecutors say that you got over $20,000 in unemployment benefits, sir. How is that acceptable? Ma'am, like I said, my employment was changed during the time. I don't understand where the government's coming from. I'll present my defense. And Santos also accused of making false, fictitious, and fraudulent statements to Congress in his required financial disclosure filings, including inflating his salary and assets while failing to disclose other income and concealing the unemployment payments. Santos today declaring his innocence. Are you planning on running for re-election? Yes, I am. But on Capitol Hill, at least a dozen House Republicans say it's time for Santos to resign. It's a distraction, and uh, and it's a punchline for a lot of uh, commentary regarding the Republican Party that we don't need. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy, who is counting on Santos's vote to remain in power, is not calling for him to step down. But tonight, for the first time, McCarthy said the congressman should not run for re-election. Santos has a lot going on. But I, think, I think he has other things to focus on his life than running for stuff. Our thanks to Rachel for that. And now to the U.S.-Mexico border, where in just a day, Title 42, that pandemic-era rule that allowed the U.S. to turn asylum seekers away, is set to expire. Crowds have already begun to gather at the border as U.S. officials brace for a new surge of migrants. Hundreds of National Guard members deployed some in riot gear. Matt Rivers on the Mexico side of the border, Maria Villarreal on the U.S. side, reporting on what's going on in this moment in time. Tonight, with just over 24 hours to go before Title 42 expires, migrants crowding at the southern border. From California to Arizona to Texas, where the National Guard is already in place, wearing riot gear in Brownsville. Federal agents sweeping through the streets of El Paso, waking migrants before dawn with flyers, warning those who had entered illegally and had not filed the proper paperwork to turn themselves in or risk being deported. Lines of migrants surrendering to Border Patrol in El Paso this week. Title 42, the pandemic-era policy that quickly expelled migrants based on COVID concerns, will end late Thursday night. And tonight, DHS Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas with a direct message. We are making it very clear that our border is not open, that crossing irregularly is against the law, and that those who are not eligible for relief will be quickly returned. DHS saying 1.4 million people have already been sent back in the last year, but Mayorkas reiterating there is a path for migrants to come in legally. Individuals who qualify for relief under our laws have a basis to remain in the United States. The contributions of immigrants to this country is quite clear. Still, starting Friday, it will be harder to claim asylum, requiring migrants to have applied for and been denied asylum in another country before being allowed to apply here in the U.S. Anyone deported is subject to at least a five-year ban from the U.S. Here at the border, migrants rushing to be processed by Border Patrol before that takes effect. We've been here for days now watching as hundreds if not thousands of migrants have crossed from Mexico going under this concertina wire and are now trapped in the shadow of the U.S. border wall in the harsh desert conditions. Here on the U.S. side near the wall, the problem has become transportation and processing. They can't get buses here fast enough to pick up all of these migrants that are coming through the wall. So groups are being metered by Border Patrol. Migrants searched as they make it through that fence and onto buses to be processed. Tonight, across the country, leaders stressing they're already overwhelmed. From Chicago. Chicago simply does not have the infrastructure or resources to continue and mainly providing for migrants. To New York State, where Rockland County is now seeking a temporary restraining order against the city of New York after the mayor there announced he would send migrants to that county. They just say basically, Rockland, be damned. We're going to do what we want to do. President Biden overnight warning this could take some time. We're doing all we can. It's going to be chaotic for a while. Our thanks to Matt Rivers for that. And tonight, Israel and the Palestinians appear to be on the brink of war. Israel claims to have hit at least 40 targets in Gaza linked to an Islamic Jihad terrorist organization. Palestinian militants fired hundreds of rockets back into Israel. ABC's foreign correspondent James Longman in Tel Aviv tonight. 
Tonight, hundreds of rockets fired from Gaza towards Israel. People running for cover on this Tel Aviv beach as air defense systems blew rockets out the sky. Beachgoers huddling in this shelter. I just start to feel the ground rumble, kind of like in between an earthquake and a firework. But it was definitely, obviously, something bigger than that. Most of the rockets intercepted and no reports of Israeli casualties. Israel launching dozens of airstrikes. Palestinian medics say six people have been killed and nearly 50 injured. Israel releasing these videos, claiming to have destroyed multiple targets. It's the heaviest violence in months and erupted after Israel assassinated three top commanders of the Palestinian militant group Islamic Jihad. At least 21 people killed since Monday, including children, according to Palestinian officials. <laughs> this little girl screaming for her father, <laughs> who along with her mother and brother were all killed. And James joins me now from Tel Aviv. James, how is the Israeli prime minister responding to this latest round of violence tonight? Well, Phil, uh, he made an address on national television tonight saying that the military are only partway through this exercise, that they will continue rooting out terrorists. He said that uh, the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, had killed some 120 terrorists since the beginning of the year. Palestinians get angry about that because they will say, well, there were leaders of the Islamic Jihad, yes, killed, but also members of their families, and they wouldn't regard them as terrorists. Uh, and so uh, this back and forth between uh, Israel and the Gaza Strip looks like likely to continue and everyone watching and waiting to see whether or not Hamas uh, gets involved in this because at the moment it's just Islamic Jihad, uh, one of the militant groups that operates in Gaza. But if Hamas, who controls the strip, if they decide to get involved, then this could escalate really quite badly. Phil? All right, James Longman from Tel Aviv. James, thank you. There is big news out of the FDA today after a panel of advisors unanimously voted in favor of allowing a specific birth control pill to be sold without a prescription. The decision comes after medical and scientific experts advised the FDA on the recommendation of O-Pill, a progestin-only pill made by French drug maker HRA Pharma. One doctor and advisor called the safety and effectiveness of the pill very reassuring. The company says if the FDA takes this non-binding recommendation and greenlights the application, the abortion pill can be available as early as this summer. This would make it the first ever over-the-counter hormonal birth control pill. Now to an ABC News exclusive with the mother of the Virginia six-year-old who shot his teacher. She is speaking out about it for the first time after a Virginia grand jury indicted and charged her with child neglect and failing to secure her son. Our Lindsay Davis spoke with that mom and her grandfather who now has custody of the six-year-old. She says she wants people to know she's a good mom. While school shootings in the U.S. are no longer a rarity, what happened at this Virginia elementary school in January was shocking. The shooter was only six years old. The victim, his 25-year-old teacher, Abigail Zwerner. Despite being shot, she managed to get all of her students to safety. Female victim, she's been shot in the abdomen as well as a through and through into the hand. Amid the ongoing criminal and civil cases, the family of the first grader who shot his teacher has remained quiet until now. Does he talk about the incident? No. He talks a lot more about the day before or the two days before um, than he does about January 6th. Shortly after the shooting, the family released a statement saying, our son suffers from an acute disability and was under a care plan at the school that included his mother or father accompanying him to class every day. The week of the shooting was the first week when we were not in class with him. What can you tell us specifically about your son's disability? So he has ADHD. Some are able to have it at a very mild rate, but he's off the wall, doesn't sit still ever. And why did the school decide that it was no not longer necessary for the family to be in, in class? He had started medication and he was meeting his goals um, academically. Had your son ever spoken like about hurting the teacher or was there anything like any angst that he had against her? No, he actually really liked her. I will say that week he did come home and he was talking, you know, a lot about how he felt like he was being ignored. So he would come home and, Mom, I don't think that she was listening to me. I didn't like that. And then actually he ended up getting suspended the next day because he was in class. He was trying to tell her something. Um, and she asked him to go sit back down. He threw his arms up, he said, fine. And when he threw his arms up, 
he knocked her phone out of her hand on accident, and he got suspended for that. Zwerner did not respond to ABC News's request for comment, but in a lawsuit, she says the student slammed the cell phone on the ground so hard that it cracked and shattered. She's now filed a $40 million lawsuit against the Newport News School District and Rich Neck Elementary officials, claiming they ignored multiple warnings about the student's behavior and concerns that he had a gun. According to the suit, the child had a history of random violence and that he attacked students and teachers alike both in and out of school. Is that description accurate? Whether it is or it isn't, the school enrolled him in September knowing all of the past behaviors. The school district released a statement to ABC News saying it cannot release information about a student's educational record. And last month, the district filed to dismiss Werner's suit, arguing her injuries fall under workers' compensation. The gun used in the shooting was legally purchased by Taylor. She says it was kept locked away. Her attorney would not say how the six-year-old got it. How did your son access the gun? Nobody knows. No one knows. Let me just ask this, and I'll direct it to you, Jimmy. Is it that no one has asked him how he got it, or you're just not ready to reveal how he got it? <laughs> We're not ready to discuss that at oh, this okay. point. Yes, people have talked to him about that. And I don't know that any adult knows exactly how he got the gun. Was the gun locked somewhere? It was locked somewhere. Mm -hmm. In April, Taylor was charged with a felony count of child neglect and a misdemeanor count of recklessly leaving a firearm as to endanger a child. Her trial is set for August. Do you feel in any way responsible for the shooting? Yes, of course. Um, that is my son. So I am, as a parent, obviously willing to take responsibility for him because he can't take responsibility for himself. Anything that either of you would like to say to Abigail's Warner? I just truly would like to apologize that, you know, out of the incident, she did get hurt. Um, we were actually kind of forming, like, a relationship with me having to be in the classroom. Mom, um, and she was a really bright person. Our thanks to Lindsay for that exclusive interview. There is still much more to get to here. Coming up, we speak with the man trying to spread spirituality, but not necessarily a specific religion, and how he's not alone. But next, the massive military development in the key fight for the city of Bakhmut as Russia and Ukraine remain locked in battle. Whenever news breaks, to crush the families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. I'm Devin Dwyer reporting from Burlington, Vermont. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're watching ABC News Live. 
Welcome back. We are tracking several headlines around the world right now. In the battered city of Bakhmut, Ukrainian military commanders say they have pushed Russian forces back by at least three square miles. It's a significant gain for Ukrainian forces there. And the leader of Russia's Wagner military group also confirmed that they had lost ground, saying they had lost about 500 soldiers while battling in that area. The city of Auckland, New Zealand, is under a state of emergency after torrential rain brought extensive flooding to the region. Take a look at these pictures. Heavy rain began on Tuesday, bringing one to two inches of rainfall per hour, actually, in some areas, with wind gusts of up to 70 miles per hour, flooding roads and homes. Actually, a young student went missing after touring a series of caves with his fellow classmates and teachers. The Auckland region has already reached 90% of its average total rainfall this year. And a sad day for residents of the small village of Brienne, Switzerland. Officials informed residents there that they had to evacuate by Friday because up to 2 million cubic meters of alpine rock could break loose within the next few days and flatten the entire village. Brienne's has a population of roughly 100 citizens who date back generations. Nobody would blame you if the events of the past few years seem overwhelming to you. The pandemic, January 6th, the increasing dire effects of climate change. And while some turn to faith in those times, an increasing number of people are identifying as spiritual, but not affiliated with a specific religion. One of those people is using his pulpit, so to speak, to inspire. Joining me now is Greg Epstein. He's the humanist chaplain of Harvard University and MIT and an atheist, which we're gonna get into in just a minute. Uh, also, by the way, in Boston parts, you're wicked smart because you're at both of these schools. <laughs> and I can say that because I'm from Boston. Uh, so thank you very much for being here. This book, uh, Good Without God, has been out uh, for quite some time, almost a decade, and I know you're writing more, but talk about your spiritual journey. You were raised uh, in the Jewish faith. Yeah, I'm culturally Jewish. Um, and thank you for having me, by the way. It's, it's an honor to be here. Um, and I'm culturally Jewish. My mom was uh, a refugee from Cuba whose family had uh, also been refugees to Cuba. Um, my dad was also the son of refugees from Eastern Europe. And I was raised in New York City in the most multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-religious neighborhood, Flushing, Queens, and maybe even society mm -hmm. ever created, ever envisioned at that point. And uh, that was so influential on in me, the idea that at the end of the day, we're all so alike, we're all so human. Catholicism and Islam and Judaism, be a good person, don't kill, you know, be kind to your neighbor. Yeah. What's the difference? So there are moral and ethical teachings, great moral and ethical teachings in every single one of the world's major religious traditions. And I honor that. And if you're a religious person, I honor you. I'm not asking you to change. I'm not suggesting that you should change. And I don't think humanism is either. The idea is that for those of us who really sincerely believe uh, that human beings created religion, that, that the world can best be explained by science without reference to theology, mm. um, there's just plenty of ways for us to pursue goodness and truth and beauty and community as well. well let's, let's then speak just about Judaism for half a second because that's sure. the faith you were raised in, uh, yeah. uh, mine as well. I know that there are rabbis um, and I believe clergy across all religions, but specifically rabbis, and I guess I should specifically my mom, um, who is concerned that the more people move towards spirituality, the less they move away from uh, the traditional aspects of a religion. And with a religion like Judaism, 15 million Jews across the world, not a billion, yeah. um, she and other clergy are concerned that the religion might disappear, you say. I say Judaism is a beautiful identity, heritage, culture, community, as well as religion. Uh, half of the world's Jews describe themselves as non-religious or secular. And I'm actually ordained as a rabbi myself. I was ordained uh, by something called the International Institute for Secular Humanistic Judaism after five years of intensive study, including a year and a half oh. in Israel. And actually becoming a humanist and really kind of being becoming firm in my atheism and my secularism, my humanism, my not being religious, made me more interested in my own cultural background and my own family's history. I'm curious, at these schools, these amazing institutions, Harvard, MIT, you split your time between the two, your chaplain there. Mm -hmm. When kids 
talk to you about the meaning of life and what they should be doing with yeah. their lives. Yeah. How do you approach that? I think these days there are so many people who have concerns and I'm meeting with as many as I possibly have, can make time for to talk about concerns about meaning and purpose of life uh, in life because people are really afraid of the change that is coming down the pipe in society, whether it's climate change or technological change or other kinds of change, including changes in, in our belief and our religion. Um, it's just people are really worried that the world is not what it used to be and what is it becoming. And a lot of times when people are concerned, they go right to religion. And people get more faithful sometimes when they're trying to make sense of these things. Yeah. Um, but you go, you go in a different direction, so how do you guide someone? Um, for me, I think that uh, being a humanist means really thinking deeply about how we are all only human, um, how there is no one right way to be a human being, to, you know, to, to, to live and to love, but there is so much that we can do for one another and with one another to make life better for everyone. Greg Epstein, thanks so much. We do appreciate you taking the time. Thank you so much, it's great to be here. And still to come, it is signing day, a group of five-year-olds making predictions and promises ahead of their biggest school year yet. I feel like the weight of the world is on my shoulders. I've seen a lot. I've been through a lot without ever having a chance to share my side of the story. Aaron Carter's life story in one sentence. The drugs, the drinking, everything goes back to tragedy. I just know I've turned it around and I've got a lot to say. There's always two sides to every story. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Right now in America, with so much at stake, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back, everyone. They are five-year-olds ready to embark on their next big adventure, kindergarten. Today, a group of kids in Lambertville, Michigan, signed contracts for the next school year, making promises and predictions for the year ahead. Reporter Whitney Burney from our partner station, WXYZ, has the story in our local lowdown. For even the most brave five-year-olds, starting school can be scary. But at Monroe Road Elementary, it just got a little less intimidating. It was a big deal, and it was amazing, and I, I didn't know what to expect. Last week, during an open house for this upcoming school year, administrators put on their first ever kindergarten signing day. Incoming students signed contracts with their handprint, promising to come in with a smile, great attitude, and a good night's rest. They also snapped these photos with their new principal before committing to the district. Did you get to stamp your hand? What color was it? Oh, yeah. An exciting memory to have for parents like Tiffany Smith. Oh, I currently have a second grader, and she loves it, and every year keeps getting better. And Logan will be going into Young Fives this year. We celebrate high school athletes going to college. We make a big deal at every high school. And I thought, why not do that to our kindergartners? Principal Alex Chapman says he got the idea from social media and has gotten quite the response since posting the photos. Chapman says while the activity is fun for kids and families, it also helps to build confidence so kids can succeed. I thought it was going to make the kids feel really special, and that's the most important part. I thought the families would get an opportunity to buy in to the school. I want them to know that they're safe, that they're loved, and that this is their school. <laughs> I see you. 
It's just a great story all around and a great picture, a great memory. Our thanks to Whitney Burney from our partner station, WXYZ. That's our show for tonight. I'm Phil Lipoff. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news context and, of course, analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and on abcnews.com. This is ABC News Live. The crush of